Number 9. Soviet Ships and Submarines Most of us think of cold, snowy regions as places where people rarely go. But these less-than-forgiving environments have actually seen a surprising amount of human activity, and we've left plenty of evidence behind. Take, for example, this image of an alleged Soviet nuclear icebreaker almost completely covered in snow and ice. It's just one of many abandoned ships and submarines that can be found throughout Russia. Some of these vessels, including a collection of deserted submarines at Vladivostok, were captured in stunning images taken by photographer and historian Robert Grenville. He published the haunting photos in the 2019 book Abandoned Cold War Places as part of his mission to document the relics of a bygone era before they disappear completely. While preserving history is an honorable cause, it would be a good thing if the many Soviet-era ships littering Russia's Far East and Far North regions disappeared. They're contributing to the wide-scale industrial pollution that threatens the increasingly fragile Arctic environment, which is already overburdened by the effects of climate change. So, as fascinating as these derelict wrecks and half-submerged abandoned vessels are, they're really only harming their surroundings. But even if the Russian government gets serious about removing its Soviet-era pollution, it would take an estimated 15 years or more to completely clean up the toxic messes. It's unfortunately safe to say that any photographer who wants to document these sites has plenty of time left to do so. Number 8. Gritviken Whalers Church The South Georgia and Sandwich Islands are British overseas territories in the southern Atlantic Ocean. They're known for their remoteness and harsh climate. They've seen limited human settlement, including no indigenous population. Some of these islands were once home to seal hunting and whaling stations, during which time their populations peaked. Located at the head of King Edward Cove, Gritviken was South Georgia Island's largest settlement and whaling station. In 1913, a group of Norwegian whalers led by Carl Anton Lassen assembled a pre-built church at Gritviken. Known interchangeably as the Gritviken or Whalers Church, the neo-Gothic-style worship site was a member of the Church of Norway. It consists of a single nave and a small altar with a library off to the side and is one of the world's most southern churches. Four different priests served at the church between 1913 and 1931. The first priest, Kristen Lücken, wrote that religion wasn't very popular among the whalers and that it left much to be desired. It's not surprising then that the church also served as a food store, cinema, and concert hall over the years. It also hosted a small funeral for ill-fated explorer Ernest Shackleton, who died from a heart attack at Gritviken in 1922 and is buried in the nearby cemetery. The settlement was abruptly abandoned in 1966 when overhunting caused the whaling industry to crash. And while the Whaler's Church isn't completely abandoned, its day-to-day -day operations ended long ago. It sees limited visitors, including crews and naval ship passengers who occasionally attend religious services and weddings. Number 7. Base W Base W is a former British Antarctic Survey research station on Detai Island off Antarctica's Aerosmith Peninsula. Built in 1956, this small outpost consists of just one long building and a pair of small outer structures. The original plan was for researchers at Base W to travel to the Antarctic mainland by dog sled to conduct studies in meteorology and geology. But the ice surrounding the island was dangerous and unstable. In 1958, the annual freeze blocked the team's supply vessel from reaching them. Even with the help of American icebreakers, it was no use. The team had no choice but to abandon the base. They packed their most important belongings and trekked 25 miles on foot to an awaiting vessel on the mainland. Base W remained untouched until the late 90s when members of the BAS visited it and found it frozen in time. Despite their scramble to get their ship out of Antarctica, the team had taken the time to properly winterize the property. It's still filled with scientific equipment, clothing, books, food, everyday items, furniture, and other things that were left behind more than 60 years ago. The doors are left unlocked, and anyone who manages to reach the snow-covered island is free to go inside and look around. Number 6. Lenin Bust The Pole of Inaccessibility is the furthest point in Antarctica from any ocean and where one can expect to find the world's coldest year-round temperature of minus 72.8 degrees Fahrenheit. It is here that the Soviets established a research station in 1958 as a way to one-up the recent construction of the American Amundsen-Scott Station at the South Pole. The base was rather simple and straightforward, consisting of a hut that housed four people, a radio shack, and an electrical hut. There was also a small airstrip, a transmitter, and a diesel power generator. But like any Soviet-sponsored structure of the time, it wouldn't have been complete without a bust of Vladimir Lenin, especially since the 40th anniversary of the Russian Revolution had passed just a year earlier. The bust was mounted on a pyramidal base and positioned to face Moscow. 
Just two weeks after setting up camp, the team left the station, which was deemed too dangerous for permanent operations. The next visit came in 1964, courtesy of the 8th Soviet Antarctic Expedition. As of 2007, the entire base had been buried by snow except for the linen bust, which poked out from the surface as a lone reminder of the short-lived Soviet presence. A team of British and American explorers called N2I went without sleep for 36 hours as they traveled to the site using kites. As they approached from less than four miles away, they noticed a dark dot off in the distance. Naturally, they wondered if sleep deprivation was causing them to see things that weren't there. Once they realized that it was Lennon waiting to greet them, the team bursted into uncontrollable shouts and laughter. That was the last time anyone visited the Pole of Inaccessibility. It's probably safe to assume that the Lennon bust is completely buried in snow by now. Number 5. Dobrovolsky Polar Research Station Built in 1956 in the Wilkes Land region of eastern Antarctica, the AB Dobrovolsky Polar Research Station is one of two polar stations in Antarctica. It was constructed by the Soviets in the Bunger Hills area before being handed over to the Polish Academy of Scientists in 1959. Simply put, the Russians lost interest in using the station due to its difficult-to-reach inland location. That was the last time the base saw regular use. Records show that a team visited periodically between then and 1979, and that the station then became inactive but not abandoned. But for all intents and purposes, it was. For the next 40 years, the property went unused by scientists and was completely devoid of a human presence, minus the occasional group of tourists who managed to reach the remote site. The station consists of two main buildings along with two pavilions and a landing area nine miles away. Their exact condition was unknown until a team of Polish scientists arrived earlier this year. They plan to reactivate and renovate the base, which will be used for studying the Earth's core. Its remote location makes it perfect for this type of research, according to expedition leader Marek Lewandowski. Speaking with Radio Poland, he described the station as a portal to the inside of the Earth, uncontaminated by human activity and seismic waves from the ocean. The team also plans to set up antennas to study the ionosphere. Hey there, and real quick, if you're new to this channel, welcome! Thanks for checking us out, and if you're liking this video, hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons. Number 4. Toxic Pollution Russia's history of Arctic research, industrial facilities, and territorial claims goes back decades. The region saw a lot of human activity during Soviet times when copious amounts of toxic debris and waste accumulated throughout the high north. When these sites were abandoned, the pollution was simply left behind and most of it still languishes today. Coastlines are littered with empty barrels, rusting vehicles and ships, diesel and other fuel, and other long-forgotten scrap metal posing an ever-present threat to the fragile Arctic environment. The Russian Defense Ministry has made at least some efforts to remove the garbage. In 2016, a reported 6,540 tons of harmful waste was removed from the old Soviet sites. And while that may sound like a lot, it's just a morsel of the estimated 5 million tons of industrial trash at the Yakusha region alone. Also known as the Republic of Sakha, Yakusha is Russia's largest region. Speaking with the Siberian Times, Nature Preservation Minister Sahamin Afanasayev said that it would cost around $1 billion to completely eradicate the rubbish. He further pointed out that the country's three-year budget plan allocated no funds for the cleanup. Russia's Emergencies Ministry conceded that 15% of its high Arctic zone is critically polluted. And as climate change advances, the problem is becoming even more critical. Following a series of alarming incidents in late 2020, including the largest ever Arctic oil spill in Norilsk, Federal Prison Service spokesperson Elena Korobkova announced plans to make inmates clean up the chronically ignored waste. But this presents its own unique set of implications, given the country's history of forced prison labor. Either way, it'll take years of intensive efforts to clear out the massive loads of pollution from Russia's high Arctic. Number 3. Governor in Wreck In 1915, the endurance vessel carrying Antarctic explorer Sir Ernest Shackleton and his crew was crushed by sea ice in the Weddell Sea. The wreck happened 800 miles from Foyne Harbor, where the Norwegian whaling ship Governorin functioned as a floating factory. At the end of the 1915 whaling season, just days after the Endurance sank to its watery grave, the Governorin's crew threw a party to celebrate their upcoming journey home. But they had a little too much fun dancing and drinking, and someone knocked an oil lamp off a table, causing the ship to catch on fire. The large amount of whale oil aboard the ship further fueled the blaze. With no other choice, the captain and crew abandoned the ship and watched from nearby as it became engulfed in flames. Luckily, all 85 crew members escaped uninjured and were rescued by another whaling vessel. 
The Governorin still sits in Foyne Harbor today, where the rusting remains serve as a reminder of the catastrophic economic loss that the fire caused after one misstep by an overly jubilant worker who was excited to go see their family. Number 2. Norwegian Coal Mines Norway's coal mining industry really took off during the late 19th and early 20th centuries when numerous settlements were established throughout the rugged Svalbard archipelago. For some companies, these glory days were short-lived. It was already difficult and barely profitable to transport coal to port via a series of aerial tramways when global coal prices dropped, making the process even less prosperous. But more coal mining operations came and went, and some are still in business today. Many have been abandoned along the way, leaving the islands littered with deserted industrial buildings, waste piles, and transport infrastructure. There are also mining settlements, including Hior Thamen, which operated from 1917 to 1921. The future of Svalbard's few remaining coal mining sites remains uncertain. In recent years, the Norwegian government has announced that it wants to see an end to this environmentally unfriendly industry, and that it plans to close down the handful of mines that are still operating. Most of the abandoned sites are open to tourists, but anyone who wishes to explore should keep in mind that Svalbard experiences a two-and-a-half-month period of complete darkness every year from mid-November to late January. There's limited daylight right before and right after this period, but the best time to visit is between March and September. Number 1. The Distant Early Warning DEW Line in 1954, U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower commissioned a network of early warning radar stations high above the Arctic Circle to warn of an impending aircraft or missile attack on North America from the polar region. It took a little over two years to build the chain of 63 stations, which stretched 3,000 miles from Alaska to Greenland along the 69th parallel. Most of the stations were located in Canada. The distant early warning line operated for less than a decade before the development of Soviet intercontinental ballistic missiles ICBMs, began to render its technology obsolete. Because the radar stations were only equipped to detect subsonic aircraft and missiles, they were ill-equipped to warn of an incoming ICBM attack. By 1963, nearly all of the line's intermediate sites were decommissioned and their four- to five-person crews left the stations behind. The employees were given just an hour's notice before they had to evacuate. Starting in the late 1980s, some of the stations that were still in operation were incorporated into the DEW line's successor, the North Warning System. During the mid-1990s, there was a massive cleanup of the left-behind stations which had basically turned into open dumps full of debris. Only a few of the abandoned DEW line stations remain today. Two of them are reportedly sinking into the Greenland ice cap, which is thousands of feet thick and will soon disappear. No efforts were made to preserve any of the sites except the LIZ-2 station in Point Lay, Alaska. These derelict properties are strewn with rusting equipment and decaying buildings. Many of these structures are half buried in snow, which has made its way into the crumbling interiors. Thanks for watching. Which one of these discoveries blew your mind the most? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks again and we'll see you next time for another amazing video right here on American Eye.